You are watching CCG Global Dialogue, 50 years of US-China exchange in retrospect, the Bush legacy and beyond, featuring Mr. Neil Bush and Mr. David Feinstein, founder and chairman, president and CEO of the George H. W. Bush Foundation for US-China relations. This program is presented to you by the Center for China and Globalization and hosted by CCG president, Dr. Wang Hui Yao. Dr. Wang. Thank, thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, and also good morning. Uh, this is uh, uh, Wang Hui Yao, uh, the founder and the president of Center for China and Globalization that uh, hosted this uh, dialogue from uh, CCG head office in Beijing. And uh, so we are really pleased to welcome all of you to tune in for this uh, CCG China and the World uh, special dialogue series. And uh, it's uh, uh, live for the, from Beijing. Thank you for joining us today, actually. And uh, so this is actually the 12th episode, and we are very honored and pleased to have two distinguished guests from uh, George H.W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China relations tonight, today. The Bush China Foundation was founded in May uh, 2017 uh, by Neil Bush uh, with blessing and support of uh, President George W. Bush and began full operations on September 2019. So this actually uh, special dialogue event was actually uh, at, as the background of the 50 years uh, anniversary of, uh, of, of course, Dr. Kissinger's visit to China, but also started the 50 years of uh, exchanges with China and uh, between China and the US, United States. But this year is also the uh, 50 years uh, of, of China joining United, United Nations. Uh, I remember uh, uh, George H. W. Bush was actually American's U. Ambassador in 1971. Uh, that's when China joined the uh, uh, United Nations. So it's a great. Uh, it's not a coincidence, you know. China has uh, started a different, uh, you know, this kind of exchange with U.S. 50 years ago. Now, also, it's the uh, 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 year of uh, uh, China joined the United Nations. Uh, Dr. Kissinger visited China in July, and China joined the. Uh, United Nations uh, in October in 1971, actually 50 years ago, uh, half a century. So we know that for both uh, uh, President uh, uh, George H. W. Bush and of course also uh, George, uh, George W. Bush, I mean, uh, it's very, uh, <laughs> very public break the history uh, for, 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 for the Bush family has two president of the United States. It's something that uh, uh, we are very, uh, 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 you know, very, uh, very honored to have uh, the, the Bush uh, Foundation that actually to talking to us, to our audience in China today. Uh, also with this background, I, I want to mention that uh, for the, uh, for the uh, George H.W. Bush, I mean, he actually uh, was the uh, US uh, uh, envoy and also maybe you can call a bicycle ambassador to, <laughs> to, to China uh, during the uh, U.S. Uh, liaison office in Beijing uh, between uh, 1974 and 1975, and uh, so so that that is really historical uh, 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 for for probably the first uh, 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 ambassador uh, status uh, 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 representative of U.S. to China as early as 1974-75. So Neil Bush, I mean <laughs> the founder of the Bush Foundation, you were also uh, in China uh, at that time made a lot of uh, visit then. So, so it's very, very uh, uh, pleased to see that we are actually talking about tonight about the Bush legacy uh, and also the implications for China-US relations and also uh, in retrospect, half a century, but also looking forward for another uh, you know, future prospect of, of China-US relations. But also I, I'd like to say that uh, uh, the George H.W. Uh, uh, Bush actually being the uh, first uh, liaison uh, office ambassador to China, but also he was uh, the president uh, uh, in 1989. And after one month in office, he paid a visit to China, the soonest uh, which took the office to visit China. And uh, his son, uh, uh, George, George W. Bush, I mean, also Neil Bush's brother, uh, had made a full visit to China. And uh, uh, so that's really impressive, including the uh, 1908 Olympic uh, game that uh, both uh, 
both Bush president actually visit China. So it's such a, a, a memorable uh, a past uh, of all the uh, good relations we have. So, uh, so I think that uh, actually uh, President uh, George H.W. Uh, uh, Bush actually said, uh, we've added a new relationship of our two countries. Uh, and also uh, we, we have established with each other, we remain firmly committed to the principles set forth in the, those three joint communique that form the basis of relationship. And actually President George W. Bush uh, even said uh, uh, in his uh, China diary, uh, diary in 2007, I love the Chinese people, uh, President Bush wrote, one of my dream for our world is that, that those two powerful giant, giants will continue working towards full partnership and friendship that will bring peace and prosperity to the people everywhere. So, so we are actually celebrating this, uh, this great legacy. And uh, so this is really a great uh, moment to, to, to look at that. So what I would like to, uh, to, to introduce uh, uh, the two very distinguished uh, uh, guests that to join us tonight is uh, uh, first is, uh, is uh, Neil Bush. Uh, uh, Neil Bush is the founder and the chair of the George H.W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China relations. He's the third of the five children of President and Mrs. George H.W. Bush. So Mr. Bush has actually been involved with energy, real estate, and international business development for the four decades be beginning 1980. Uh, but for the past 25 years, Mr. Bush has engaged in various international business development activities with a focus on China. He first visited China in 1975 when his father was the chief liaison officer representing the United States in Beijing. His business and personal interest have allowed for many return trips over the years. Since 1975, Mr. Bush has traveled to China over 140 times and has visited over 40 cities in China. So, so it's a remarkable uh, record. I think probably only Kissinger <laughs> Maybe had made that many trips. Uh, uh, probably you had made more than that. Uh, but also, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, another distinguished uh, guest tonight is uh, uh, David Firestam. He, he's the, actually the inaugural president and CEO of the George H. W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China relations, or you can call uh, a Bush China Foundation. And also a founding and current member of the foundation board of directors. And prior to joining the Bush China Foundation, Mr. Feistam was the founding executive director of the University of Texas, Austin, China Public Policy Center. And also he's a, a professor at the University of London B. Johnson School of Public Affairs. Of course, before moving to University of Texas, Mr. Feistam served as a senior vice president and payroll fellow of the New York City-based East West Institute where he led the Institute track to that diplomacy dialogue. So very experienced uh, 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 citizen, also diplomat, a decorated career of US diplomat from 1992 to 2010. Uh, Mr. Feinstein special, specialized primarily in the US-China relations. So a very old friend of China, also, uh, uh, also very senior China hand. And uh, of course, I remember we hosted you in, in 2012 uh, uh, when CCG hosted you there at the Western Return Scholar Association, you were giving an analysis of the U.S. Uh, election, uh, president election in 2012. So uh, it's quite, quite almost a decade ago. Now we see tremendous changes. So, so I would like to start the dialogue uh, uh, tonight uh, with, uh, with, uh, you know, with Bush Foundation and also the, the senior representative of Bush Foundation. So. President George H.W. Bush was the pioneer in the U.S.-China diplomacy. He was the U.S. chief diplomatic envoy in China during the 1974-75, which was before U.S. and China formally established diplomatic ties. So, Neil, you, you, you first, uh, I remember you, you, you said something, you first visited China in 1975, and of, of, of course, continued travel to China on a regular basis since then. So, given you have made to China and travel to China one sometimes. Uh, so you have witnessed actually firsthand in the last, you know, four or five decades of the, of the, of the uh, tremendous changes that China has made. So, so maybe you can give your first uh, uh, assessment actually, of what you see the relationship. 
First of all, Henry, thank you so much for having us on your on your show as part of the dialogue. You do such wonderful work uh, bringing ideas out and uh, helping to inform the public. Um, I, I think I'll start by re reflecting back on October of 1971. You mentioned that the, that the Chinese were admitted or China was admitted to the UN. I happened to be in New York City during that during that vote. Uh, my dad worked tired, tirelessly promoting uh, the two China representation concept. That's a, that was the position of the U.S. government at the time. Um, they got voted down and China was admitted. Taiwan was, was kicked out. The first thing my dad did when the Chinese delegation arrived into the United States was invite them to a lunch at my grandmother's home in Connecticut to show um, kind of American hospitality. To, to welcome them with an with open arms, um, and and from that point on, his first real contact with Chinese leaders, my dad has, as you pointed out in the in the the, the letter you referred to, has had an affection for the Chinese people, and 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 has high aspirations for how our two great countries should be working together. Yes, I was there in 1975. My my three of my siblings and I visited for five weeks. We were in Beijing for four weeks and then traveled with my mother by train to Wuxi, Nanjing, and, and um, Shanghai. And it has been a remarkable thing to sit on the sidelines and to witness this incredible growth uh, that China has experienced over the past 46 years when I was first there. The China I saw in 1975, and you know, I don't want to be offensive to anyone, but was basically freedomless. Everyone was equal. They were equally poor. Um, and that people were friendly to, uh, towards us. We rode our bikes all over the place and we were, we were treated very kindly. But there was propaganda machines everywhere. Everywhere you go, the, the word was being spouted out. People were still being sent to the end of the Cultural Revolution, being sent to the countryside. And, um, and people couldn't choose make daily choices that clearly they can make today. And so looking back 46 years later, it, it, if I were back in 1975, I, I couldn't have predicted or imagined that China would have had hundreds of millions of people lifted out of poverty, that the middle class would be growing as rapidly as it is, that the economy continues to, to, to churn out new jobs and, and crank out wealth for people, that people would enjoy daily freedoms that, that frankly, back then were clearly unimaginable, you know, happening in China. So I, I've been deeply impressed by this, Henry. I'll, I'll be honest with you. And I think one of the things that separates me from other, other folks is the fact that I've been there and seen it grow over the many years. I've come to some deep conclusions. One, you know, not every, there's no single system that works for every country that every country needs to develop a system that is suitable and fitting for the conditions of that country. China's system has worked for China. If you look at the results over the many years, over the 46 years since I was there, over the 40 something years since formal ties have been established, the, the results speak for themselves. And so I, I, I'm, I'm a believer that, you know, our system works for us, their system, your system, the Chinese system works for China. We need to be respectful of, of, of that. And, and clearly Americans, God, I've, been, I've been amazed. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and just say that I've been amazed to be able to witness this, um, this change in China. And, you know, no one could have predicted it back 46 years ago. Yeah, uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Neil. Actually, uh, absolutely. You, you are the witness of this uh, great transformation that has been taking place uh, in China in the last uh, four or five decades. I mean, uh, you know, since China joined the UN and, and of course uh, uh, we, we re-established its position at the UN, but also, uh, 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 you know, since uh, your father as the fourth envoy uh, uh, to China, 1974, 75, that is really how the US and China gradually normalized the relations and, uh, and paved the way for the, uh, for the uh, great progress. I'm glad to hear that your, your father actually hosted the launch for the, for the incoming uh, delegates to, to the UN. That, that, was, uh, uh, that was really early, uh, early on. That's, uh, that's showed uh, 
you know, I'm sure that uh, uh, your father was uh, eight years as a vice president of uh, 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 Ronald Reagan and also served as the president of the United States. I'm sure he has done a lot of uh, uh, memorable work and uh, also what he was saying that uh, uh, the two, two, two great giants should work together. I mean, absolutely, uh, for, the, for, the, for the benefit of the mankind. Uh, he's right. absolutely right. So, 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 so what, do you still remember some of the things you, you've seen at the, the Beijing? Uh, uh, you know, you yeah. said you're four weeks there. I, I remember your father was <laughs> in bicycle and that. He ride a bike, yeah. his name is the photo at the, at the Tiananmen Square. What about you? When you and your brother and sister came? Uh, no, five uh, we had. We had the same experience. We rode bikes all over the place. It was really fun. We rode to Tiananmen Square. I, I distinctly remember pulling up to a stop sign, you know, where the guards were there with their hands up and stuff. And the, the crowd of bikes were stopped and gathered. And, and when, when the, those of us that were, you know, from America, the kind of white guys, long nose, they'd look yes. over and see us and they'd almost fall off their bikes. Yeah, we went to the zoo, Henry, to go see the pandas and other animals. And you look behind us and there's a bigger crowd following us at the zoo than they, they were looking at the animals. It was, we were such a, you know, anyway, but it was a friendly, um, you know, adventure for us. Um, one of the things I observed, and this is something dad and I talked about during that trip was that if you, if you um, observed Chinese consumers, Chinese individuals walking by like a, like a bike shop, or a, a, a shop that had like kitchen utensils or whatever, you could see in their eyes that they wanted more, that they wanted a better bike, a better flying pigeon or whatever bike. Um, and so it's, it was, I don't know, it was pretty clear that the, there were aspirations even then that had now led to this incredible, you know, growth and, and uh, realization of, of potential. But yeah, now I have vivid memories of it. And if now I go back to China and, you know, cars everywhere, there's, it's, it's, it's like totally transformed. It's an amazing transformation, high speed rail and, you know, internet connectivity everywhere. It's like a whole new world that couldn't have been imagined back in the bi bicycle riding days of, of the 1970s. Yeah, yeah, great. <laughs> you've, been, you've been really seeing China. Uh, you know, develop from bicycle kingdom to an automobile kingdom, now the largest uh, automobile market in the world. <laughs> that was really, yeah. you see that in the four decades. Time. Oh, and it's, and it's leapfrogged. I mentioned high speed rail. I mean, it, you know, other countries, other developed countries, or even developing countries in the world can't, have not been able to keep up with China in the deployment of high speed rail. And it's, a, it, I've been on many train rides that have been very efficient. They're quiet, they're fast, they're clean. You know, and it's um, it's it's there's a there's a leapfrog capability that China is enjoying uh, that that really sets it apart in in many respects. Um, anyway, so yeah, it's 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 sure. gone from bicycles to you know the car car consuming you know yes. capital of the world, and and also now leapfrog to the high speed rail. Yes, yes, that's right. You you see that all the development stages. So so uh, so uh, uh, David, and uh, you also <laughs> lived in China for. For, for many, many years, and uh, you've been actually 20 years involved with, uh, with China uh, uh, as well as, as a diplomat, but also now you, you are still working on this. So, so, so what's your impression on China and, uh, and uh, probably also what now you are, you are, you are uh, you know, uh, president of the Bush uh, uh, China Foundation now. So, so what, what is your, uh, uh, you know, memories and, and also how, how do you think the Bush uh, foundation for both uh, uh, Neil and you to to take this forward. Maybe maybe you can give you more discussion on that, David. David. Well, Henry, thank thank you so much. And again, it's it's an honor to be with you, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity to have this conversation. Um, you know, I first went to China in 1984, so nine years later than Neil did, and and yet I I absolutely uh, understand um, everything that Neil's saying in terms of the transformation that has occurred in China and uh, the um, the degree to which average people since the 1970s and 1980s to the present date have seen their ability to make choices for themselves in their daily lives. Uh, that ability has grown in ways that just as Neil said, were, were really unimaginable, I think, to the average 
Chinese citizen back in the 1970s or in the 1980s when I first visited China and as a teenager, but just the ability to choose uh, whether to um, go to college or the or what your major might be or to choose to perhaps study abroad and do undergraduate work abroad rather than in China. The ability to choose where you live and to purchase a home, the ability to uh, choose where you work uh, or how long you work there. Uh, in the old unit system or Danway system back in the old days, you know, you didn't have a say over where you worked and uh, you know, whether you could quit and so forth and so on. And now all those choices are available to average people uh, all across the country. Uh, the ability to, you know, have those, those kinds of uh, decisions within your own grasp and within your own decision-making authority, that's probably the most fundamental transformation that I have seen uh, in China, very much as Neil uh, laid out. And uh, I think if I were summarizing it in, in kind of one idea or one sentence, it would be uh, that uh, when I first visited China in the 1980s, I think the average citizen didn't feel that they had a lot of control uh, over their own destiny uh, with respect to these myriad really important decisions in their personal lives. Uh, but now, uh, and certainly I think since the 1990s and unquestionably uh, today, the average uh, Chinese citizen I think feels that they have vastly more ability to shape their future than they did in the 1970s, 1980s, and so on. So it has been an incredible transformation. And of course, that's to say nothing of the physical transformation that's occurred uh, in China and that uh, you, Henry, and Neil were just discussing. Um, at the Bush China Foundation, or the, the George H.W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China Relations, our mission is to advance the U.S.-China relationship in ways that reflect the ethos, spirit, and values of President George H.W. Bush. And as you mentioned at the outset, uh, when Neil founded the George H.W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China Relations with the blessing and support of his father, George H.W. Bush, uh, that was very much the mindset. Uh, and um, I am so honored to be able to work side by side uh, with Neil to carry forward the George H.W. Bush um, vision for the relationship. Uh, Henry, you mentioned one of uh, President George H.W. Bush's most famous quotes when it comes to China, and it's one that we talk about all the time at the foundation. But I want to note that uh, fundamentally, uh, the George H.W. Bush vision for the relationship uh, is grounded in two beliefs, uh, core beliefs, I would say. Number one, that the U.S.-China relationship is the single most consequential bilateral relationship in the world. And in fact, I would say in the history of the world. And number two, that no major international problem or challenge can be enduringly resolved in the absence of effective U.S.-China cooperation. That's what President George H.W. Bush believed. That's what Neil believes. That's what I believe. And that's what our foundation is all about, is to try to facilitate U.S.-China engagement and collaboration, not out of altruism, but because it is good for both countries, it is good for the relationship, and it's good for the world. And I couldn't be more proud to work for and with Neil and to be a part of this incredible foundation. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, David, actually. That, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the Bush uh, China Foundation has, has done many things. I, I noticed in the last two years, uh, actually several years, you've, you've done, uh, you know, the conferences, you've done, uh, you know, webinars related with many, many areas. So exactly, we, we need this uh, uh, foundation to, to, to actually to have better understanding and uh, promote uh, exchanges between our two countries. Uh, Henry, now, yeah, Henry, I'd, I'd like to I'd like to piggyback off of that comment um, by by um, reminding you and, and others that my dad, after he retired from the presidency, um, chose to be active in establishing dialogue, much like your program, Henry, between China and the, and the United States. And he did so in the form of a conference, a, a U.S. China relations conference that he co-hosted with an old friend, uh, Madam Li Xiaolin on the Chinese side. That conference he attended, he actively promoted, he brought in you know, representation from the, from the US side, the Chinese side you know, brought in equal representation. And for, I think he attended five or six, David, do you, do you recall? But he attended and, and hosted five or six of those. So that was basically the founding of our organization. Now, those are the roots of where our organization, you know, sprouted from. 
Um, and his and, and as he got older and couldn't actually participate in these these conferences, he asked me to chair from the U.S. side. And it just spun out it, out of that spun the, the uh, George H.W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China Relations. And he was very pleased to see that the programmatic activity, starting with what he started, the conference, has now expanded to many other areas under David's very, very capable leadership. And by the way, I don't know if your audience would like to hear this, but David speaks like perfectly fluent Chinese. It's like <laughs> apparently amazing, <laughs> amazing Chinese. <laughs> After 140 visits, you'd think I'd be able to say, you know, you know, like one more beer, please. But that's about or Ni Hao and Sai Jin. But anyway, David speaks fluent Chinese. He's a great leader for our organization. Yeah, no, I, 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 I absolutely uh, agree with you. I mean, absolutely. I, I see that uh, George H.W. Bush uh, uh, has actually started this tradition of, uh, of this uh, China-U.S. Uh, conference for, for many years. I remember uh, many friends has attended that and has uh, speak highly of the, of the efforts uh, of the conference in promoting the exchanges and the dialogues and the understanding of the two countries. But also, uh, you know, in all those time, it was really very valuable giving his uh, advice and uh, his, uh, his presence. I, I, I'm, I'm glad that you succeeded him in doing this and also now coupled with, uh, with David. I know David is a perfect uh, China hand. I mean, he spoke uh, probably one of the best uh, foreigners speak Mandarin <laughs> that you could find. Uh, he has interpreted for many, many senior people too. So, so I remember when, when, when we invited David uh, to come to speak at the CCG event in 2012, which is almost 10 years ago. He, he, he already impressed me then. And also he's writing two Chinese books. I mean, <laughs> out of the several <laughs> books right in China, two, two of them written in Chinese. Uh, uh, that is very rare for, for any foreigners to, to see that. So, so this is actually really great, uh, great uh, legacy and great tradition uh, that we have. And uh, so, so somehow, you know, I mean, unfortunately, I mean, since uh, both uh, uh, George, uh, your father, George H.W. Uh, Bush, and your brother, uh, George W. Bush, are both Republican parties and uh, a Republican president, uh, and has actually made the most visit. Your father stayed in China for a year or two. You, uh, your, 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 your brother made a full presidential visit and you know, two official visits, one APEC summit and one Olympic games. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of good uh, uh, you know, relationship building and uh, 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 you know, the, 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 the dialogue uh, uh, exchanges. But somehow, unfortunately, you know, for the last several years, I mean, probably the last uh, uh, five years, particularly since uh, Republic President Trump like, took the office, we see China-US relations somehow, you know, uh, uh, deteriorate uh, quite, quite a bit. And uh, so this kind of uh, 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 deterioration, I, you know, we, we, we don't know what, what are the reasons, but but definitely, uh, even now President Biden comes up, uh, they're still saying, okay, China, probably some were better now, but, but still, they say China is, uh, is a, can be cooperative, can compete, but also can be a rivalry. So we don't want to be a rivalry. Uh, so, but also uh, uh, President Trump started this uh, trade, trade war, trade sanction with China. We see many uh, Republicans actually calling for a lift uh, uh, those tariffs, as I was just talking uh, recently with uh, Randy Cutler, the, the former acting USTR, and uh, she was saying, you know, maybe we should uh, lift those tariffs. It's no good for China, so for US as well. And recently, US-China Business Council have done a survey that to find this tariff actually cost US almost a quarter million jobs and, and many, many costs. Uh, uh, and, but still, China and US trade is still uh, China imported as much as uh, you know, increasing still, and also the trade has increased. Uh, so, so what what do you two, you know assess this uh, uh, current China-U.S. Uh, relations, and how we can really uh, improve that? How we can really uh, uh, maybe get a bit uh, a normalcy there, rather than we are uh, we are we are we are now uh, in such kind of a, a, a deteriorated position. And and of course, also I've been talking with a number of U.S. opinion leaders like. Uh, Graham Allison, Joseph Nye, and uh, 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 of course, John Sonten just recently, and of course, uh, uh, Seng Tan Head and, uh, and Susan Sonten, uh, uh, and Ambassador Roy, I mean, <laughs> you know, many of them. They, they, they all say, you know, we shouldn't be have a, have a 
uh, uh, Cold War, we should not decouple and, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they have all that kind of a consensus. Of course, how can we, those countries work better towards a, a better relation, uh, given your foundation's view, maybe your, your personal view as well? You know, I might take a, take a high level stab at this and then let David dig, dive deeper. Um, first of all, you, you, you referenced the, the, the deterioration in the, in the relationship. Um, and it, it strikes me that there are a number of converging factors that have led to the US side um, uh, becoming fearful of China's rise. And, and that fear is reflected in rhetoric that has become under the Trump administration quite harsh. Um, and, and, and with that became kind of a, an isolationist approach of stepping back and not having dialogue. My, my dad believed at his core that, you know, that countries and families and friends, you know, need to stay in touch with one another in order to better understand one another, in order to put yourself in the other guy's shoes so that when conflict arises, you can address those conflicts in a mature way. We got away from that for five years or so, and maybe even prior to that, David can give his analysis. There, th that coupled with the US problem of kind of America first, build the wall, anti-immigrant, you know, we're the greatest country on the face of the planet. And to see China's economic rise to where it's now at parity or you know, just behind the US economy on a gross basis, not per capita, but on a gross basis, you know, there are a lot of a lot of politicians you know, are fearful of, of, of losing our prominence in that way. Um, and then a third factor is politically, given that there's not very good information about China floating around in this, in this you know, uh, ecosystem in the US, uh, politically, it's an, China's an easy target. You know, we, 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 we see politicians blasting the Communist Party as though it was the party that, that was, was kind of manifested itself in different ways very early. In um, in the People's Republic of China's history, um, so so they so there's a there's a lot of China bashing, and it gets to you know the 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 Thucydides trap issue that as China rises and America being the prominent power in the world, you know faces this rising power. How are we going to react? And a lot of people in our country, many politicians are reacting quite poorly to it and thinking that uh, you know China is a, a existential threat to our economic and to our, our national security. Um, and, and by the way, I'll, I'll quickly hasten to add that clearly any bilateral relationship is gonna have issues between, between countries. We have issues with France, we have issues with Germany, we have is issues with Israel, we have is issues with our closest friends. We're gonna have issues with China and, and we're gonna address as Americans, we have values that we stand firmly behind. We're gonna express those values in a way, hopefully in a way that's respectful and, and, um, and not, not uh, finger pointing or, or in a derogatory way, but we'll express our values in the hopes that we can help shape outcomes and that kind of thing. Um, but the ultimate goal should be to, to come together as often as possible in as many different ways as possible and, and to, to resolve um, challenges, you know, respectfully and, and maturely. I'm going to let David, you know, talk about the tariffs thing. My, my, per, my, my view of the tariffs is it was such a stupid idea to start with. You know, the idea of raising tariffs that was a tax to American consumers you know, hurting American business, which, you know, David can get in the statistics. I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a non-starter. Trump's idea, and I think people behind Trump, their idea was that if we have a trade deficit with a country, we've got to re redress that by putting up tariffs and, you know, balancing out the trade. But the, the reality is that in global trade, some countries have goods that are good quality goods that are provided at a lower cost that richer countries want to buy. And poorer countries, developing countries can't afford to buy the stuff from the poorer countries. So therefore, there's going to be a trade imbalance. And that's OK. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing in Economics 101 that says that a trade imbalance is unnatural or inappropriate or bad. And so, so it, was a, it was a silly thesis in the first place. 
I think it may have been deep down inside that logic might have been to be punitive towards the Chinese to try to set the Chinese economy back, but that was that was illogical as well. So it was a failed policy that needs to be reversed. And um, anyway, David, I'll let you clean up my mess. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you raised a lot of good points. Thank you. Yeah. No, David, please. Well, Henry, thanks, and Neil, thank you. And and just to pick up on on, on the really good points that Neil made about tariffs. I mean, Neil and I both, uh, even before we met each other uh, three years ago, were both uh, you know uh, very much uh, very critical of the U.S. policy on tariffs and the Trump tariffs uh, on the same grounds that they're bad for America, they're bad for American companies, they're bad for American workers. They kill jobs, they blow out the deficit, and they do nothing to solve any of the core problems that exist, that actually do exist between the United States and China in the trade area. And uh, I agree fully with everything Neil just said with respect to tariffs. And we, we as individuals and as a foundation have been very outspoken, maybe more outspoken than almost any other entity in the country when it comes to the uh, how uh, how bad for America the tariffs are. Let me let me cite a couple of things, and then I'll move Henry to the broader question that you've asked. But I think this needs to be said. I mean, the numbers are in. The jury is in with respect to the tariffs. We don't have to speculate or offer opinions about it. We can actually look at the factual record. Under President Trump, we had the highest U.S. trade deficit with China in American history. Under President Trump, we had the highest average annual merchandise trade deficit with China of any presidency in the history. So to compare apples to apples, the entire presidency, uh, the average annual, uh, average annual def uh, deficit with China was higher under Trump than any other previous presidency. Uh, so those numbers speak for themselves. It wasn't just a one year wonder type of phenomenon. It was it was four years. Um, the U.S. trade deficit with the world grew to record levels under President Trump. We lost manufacturing jobs, tens of thousands of them under President Trump. We lost jobs overall, 250,000, as Neil just cited, from the U.S.-China Business Council under these imbecilic policies. Uh, the historic U.S. trade surplus with China in agriculture became a trade deficit for the first time in 25 years, something that none of us thought was even possible. And of course, uh, American uh, consumers ended up paying more to the tune of about $1,000 or even $2,000 a year, uh, more than they were uh, before the tariffs came into play. By every single metric that you could possibly uh, cite, uh, the tariffs were just exactly as Neil said, an absolutely failed policy that was horrible for America, is horrible for America, and we need to get rid of it. Uh, the, 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 the Trump tariffs were predicated on the idea that comparative advantage uh, doesn't exist. And uh, that is as unrepublican and un-American a thought as you could ever conceive. Uh, comparative advantage does exist. And we have to get back to the idea that the pie gets bigger when countries produce what they're best at producing. And even imperfect trade is better than no trade. So we've got to get back uh, to, to, to um, classical American thinking. And I want to say, uh, before I transition just briefly, Henry, to your other question, uh, that the, the George H.W. Bush Foundation uh, for U.S.-China Relations, true to the values and beliefs of President George H.W. Bush, is a pro-business, pro-trade, pro-globalization organization, unapologetically, because we understand economics and we understand that uh, trade is uh, good for America, it's good for the world, and we want to move back in that direction and we advocate in that direction. Henry, to your broader question about um, the fact that originally Republicans uh, were at the cutting edge of um, getting the U.S.-China relationship in its modern form uh, going, uh, going back to President Nixon and, of course, Secretary Kissinger, and obviously the incredible role that President George H.W. Bush played and other Republicans along the way, uh, the point that I want to make is that for um, most of the last 50 years, up until about five years ago, uh, the idea that engaging China and having a constructive and robust and healthy and functional relationship with China, it was not just a Republican idea. It was a, it was a bipartisan consensus that held uh, through the presidencies of seven or eight presidents dating back to Nixon and through the, the uh, end of the term of uh, President Barack Obama. 
Um, it only changed during uh, President Trump's campaign and as he came into office. But there has always been a bipartisan consensus that it is good for America to engage China, uh, notwithstanding the difficulties and I would frankly say the irreconcilable differences that we have between our countries, even with all of that, that there is value uh, and benefit to engaging China, working together, being clear-eyed about the relationship, certainly, but uh, coming together to solve problems that neither country can solve on its own. That consensus has existed uh, up until the Trump era. Now we have a new consensus, unfortunately, uh, in uh, official Washington, and that is that China uh, is really the enemy of our nation. There's a vast swath of official Washington that seems to believe that. And there's a significant swath of the American public that has come to believe that. I think uh, Neil and I and the Bush China Foundation reject that, uh, that idea and that, that belief. Um, but I think that belief is rooted in two erroneous assessments of China's um, intentions. One, that China seeks to displace the United States and supplant the United States as the world's only superpower. And I think that is an absolutely fundamental misreading of what China actually wants to do. And number two, that China seeks to replicate its system all across the world and create a bunch of countries that look exactly like China uh, and basically to push forward uh, its system as, as uh, uh, you know, across the world so that there are you know, more systems that look like China's than there are today. I think those are incorrect understandings of what China actually seeks to do. And when the fundamental premises of US policy toward China are wrong, the resulting policies that's, that, that purport to address those uh, concerns are going to veer off course. And I think that's what we've seen over the last several years. So you know, we need to have a sharp focus on US interests and to uh, get the emotions out of our policy formulation and policy execution and focus as President George H.W. Bush did on the long-term interests of our nation. And I think if we do that, we can get this relationship back on course. Yeah, great. Uh, th thank you uh, both Neil and uh, David. Uh, excellent uh, points. That, uh, uh, I think that uh, you're right. You know what, uh, I, I, for the last five, six years, there seems to be more misstanding between the two countries. And I think we, we all need to really work hard to, <laughs> to really, uh, to, to, to get a dialogue, get a communication, and get the right understanding, exactly like what we're, uh, we're doing uh, tonight uh, as well. And uh, I, I think that uh, trade uh, is absolutely so obvious uh, that, uh, you know, since the Second World War, the trade boom has actually uh, given the perspective to the world and actually prevented the Third World War. And uh, we, we are still living in largely peace and prosperity because of the trade and the uh, and this is actually a competitive advantage you talk about, you know, that David Ricardo's uh, theory that, uh, you know, the country does best that maybe we should exchange. And, and the U.S. has many areas, technology, <laughs> uh, you know, U.S. financial uh, power and uh, uh, dominance in, 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 in the internet and many areas. So, so, so China has been doing well in infrastructure and also and many other, I, I see a lot of collaboration there. Uh, but just unfortunately now we're, we're actually, you know, we're facing the whole world is facing a, a huge challenge. We've been, uh, uh, you know, in this uh, pandemic, this COVID-19, uh, now we're getting probably COVID-2012 now. It's, it's really still, uh, you know, cutting us off uh, at least uh, for travel. So, so what do you think that we should really work together on, on this? Because I, I see this as a biggest opportunities, like we, I was talking to Susan uh, Santon, the former assistant deputy secretary of the US. She was saying, you know, look, I mean, the COVID-19 could be the best occasion uh, for the US and China to, to, to let bygone be bygone. Let's, let's concentrate on this common threat, enemy number one to the humankind, rather than we have actually, uh, now because of COVID-19, we have actually divided even more so. Uh, I mean, you have this origin of tracing and the blaming of, on China, but also, uh, there is, uh, we see, uh, uh, you know, uh, finger pointing uh, as well. And uh, how do you think that we can uh, fight this uh, uh, pandemic? And uh, uh, how can we revive the, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the, the world travel? How WHO can really work together? You know, I mean, US now is, is maybe lifting some of the lockdown, but then we have, you have the 
you have some surge again in, in some area. But you know what, what's the experience US has and, and China has, maybe we can really work together, vaccine recognition, uh, you know, travel kind of exchanges. And now we see that uh, US just, uh, uh, according to the US embassy here, uh, in the last three months from May, June and July, US embassy has issued uh, uh, almost 80, 850,000, uh, no, 85,000 student visa. We have a miles long queue at the Pudong International Airport. So, you know, student going back to the United States and, uh, and but, you know, uh, and, and yet uh, US student can, student can come to China. So how can we really, you know, get this US China working together on this pandemic fighting rather than we, uh, you know, point the finger and, 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 and shout at each other? Yeah, that's a great question. And, it, and it's a question I would ask on, on a number of major topics that, that affect the sustainability of life on earth for humans, including climate change, uh, food insecurity, everything health related. The pandemic is kind of the most obvious and, and most pressing matter that you brought up. Um, but we, because of climate change, we have all kinds of natural disasters. How, how can we learn to either alter the course of this climate change so that so that the earth will be, you know, be able to, to, to carry on for many more years beyond the current trajectory. Or it, so these are big issues. Um, and clearly the two largest economies in the world, as David pointed out in his opening comment, you know, have to work together. In fact, it's hard to imagine not solving these issues without the collaboration of China and the, in the United States. There's a, there's a clear mandate and necessity for all of us to share our common humanity in addressing these, these kinds of issues. And I agree with you, the frustration over the finger pointing, I mean, especially at the beginning of the outbreak, you know, we had a, I don't know, diet, we had messaging coming out of the White House that said, oh, it's just gonna be here for a little while. We have 13 cases, it's all gonna go away and blah, blah, blah. Oh okay, yeah, we're gonna have a mask mandate, but I'm not gonna wear a mask. And you know, yeah, everybody should get vaccinated, but no, there's no, there's no real push. And so there's a huge kind of anti-vax movement in the United States. We, 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 we don't have a national pride or national um, drive to combat this pandemic in a way that, that we as a nation could, but we should learn from one another. You know, we should be open-minded about looking at what New Zealand has done and what Australia has done, what China has done, what other countries have done. We should share the best technologies that exist for vaccine development and have manufacturers all over the world convert their manufacturing to, vac to vaccine manufacturing of qualified vaccines so that uh, the, the global population could be more readily vaccinated against this pandemic and the spread of it through the various variants. Um, you know, the drugs that, are, that, that can be administered, all of these kinds of things need to be, there needs to be more of an of a environment of collaboration, which sadly doesn't exist today. And I, I'm, I'm not, I'm convinced that, that you know, that things are, will change over time. I'm, I may be the only guy out there that says this, but I do believe that this administration you know, is already creating more opportunities for exchange and dialogue and that kind of thing. And inevitably, when you sit down and you have dialogue with, with counterparts, good things come out of it. Better understanding and, and, and um, you know, an addressing of serious issues. And the, I, the topic of collaborating on the pandemic and, and healthcare related issues in general should be, should be front and center on, on the table of, for discussion. Yeah, yeah, great. I, I think you, you, you mentioned those uh, very important issues and, uh, you know, we should really work together on this, uh, on this uh, uh, you know, uh, pandemic fighting, uh, a vaccine <laughs> recognition and, uh, and, and also learn from each other. Absolutely. I mean, uh, we need a lot of cooperation in, 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 in combating the, the, the COVID-19. And actually, this could be a, a punishment of the, of the nature that we are not really respect the uh, sustainable and climate change it could you know so this is a huge lesson for us so so david yeah. what's your what's your what's your uh take on this well henry thank you and um uh, you know I, I i think neil has said it really well i i would just amplify one one point with respect to COVID 19 and, and let me make a broader point to uh, at the outset 
Um, absolutely, COVID-19 and pandemics generally and public global public health uh, even more broadly are areas where the United States and China should be collaborating because these are the very definition of the kinds of issues and they're not the only ones where no one country by definition can solve these problems. These problems require a collaboration from all the major players in the world. And um, instead of thinking of COVID-19 here in the United States as a kind of wedge issue between the United States and China, we ought to be thinking of it, uh, just as Neil said, and Henry, as you said, as an opportunity for collaboration, not because it's a warm and fuzzy or altruistic thing to do, but because lives depend on our ability to collaborate. And uh, as I said in an interview a little over a year ago, in May or so of, of, of last year, you know, when a house is on fire, uh, the first thing you do is you say, who's in the house and how do we get them out? You don't say who started the fire. And yet we saw in the United States uh, this propensity to demonize China, to lambast uh, China and, and assume the absolute worst about its motivations. Uh, and um, what we really should have been talking about at that time was how do we save lives and how do we uh, work together to bring as early an end to this pandemic as we possibly can. And with respect to this particular facet of the issue, I just want to say uh, here what, what uh, I and we, and we as a foundation have said emphatically many times, and that was that the, um, the, the racially charged and I would say racist rhetoric that emanated from President Trump and other senior members of the executive branch, the then Secretary of State, uh, Mr. Pompeo and members of Congress was despicable. It was repugnant, it was deplorable, and it was wrong. And it was far beneath the dignity of any office holder in this nation. Uh, it, is, uh, it is not how we should be communicating. The notion that people were using terms such as, quote, China virus or, quote, Chinese virus, or even worse, quote, Kung flu, this is a disgrace. This is a, this brings shame on our nation for any serious political figure uh, elected or appointed to use that kind of reprehensible language. And of course, as a result, and predictably, it drove uh, the numbers of, of uh, anti-Asian racist violence through the roof. And that is deplorable and absolutely um, uh, tragic. And so we as a foundation spoke out and continue to speak out about this um, you know, we've got to uh, get back to a, and I think we are now under this administration, a much more mature and less juvenile style of communication. Because when you start throwing around uh, these types of terms, uh, any possibility of collaboration goes out the door, even if there really are valuable areas where we ought to be collaborating. So the language matters, the communication matters, and boy, what I wouldn't give to have, um, you know, um, a, a way of thinking about communication and thinking about bringing people together uh, of the type that we saw under the presidency of George H.W. Bush. To his credit, President Joe Biden has um, gotten rid of that kind of language. He's banned it from the White House. He said he will fire people, for, and he's done it, for using language that is not uh, appropriate for the White House of our nation. And uh, I think we're getting back to some of the norms that were established uh, under many presidents, but uh, that is a really important part of the COVID piece. If we don't communicate in a mature and professional and serious and business-like way, any hope of, of collaboration that would benefit all of us uh, becomes very remote. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Neil and, and David for your very uh, open and frank and uh, and a very uh, positive uh, uh, discussion. I, I agree, I absolutely agree with you. I think that, uh, uh, you know, we need to improve our communication uh, dialogues. And uh, I mean, the COVID-19 already uh, st uh, separated us. We, we can't have a face-to-face -face meetings. So we should really be careful of, of our languages and of, uh, our, 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 you know, the discussion and in exchanges. I, I'm glad to see uh, President Biden, act, when he comes to the office, he actually signed an executive order banning the use of ethnic language refused, refers to the to the virus. Uh, uh, so that is a good good sign. So so we hope that uh, uh, things can can get better. I, I know that uh, now we, we can talk a bit more on that. But you know, President Biden is already uh, over six months in the office, 
and uh, China and US, we had uh, quite a several rounds of uh, discussion. We had the uh, Alaska encounter and, uh, and uh, with uh, uh, Secretary Blinken and, uh, and, and Chinese senior diplomats. Of course, recently uh, we had uh, Deputy Secretary of State uh, 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 Wendy Sherman come to Tianjin. We had a second round of discussion. And uh, so it seems, of course, a second time, I, I would say it's better than first time, <laughs> but still. Uh, we, well, one of the best was actually, I think, uh, was uh, uh, former uh, Secretary of State, now Special Envoy, uh, John Kerry's visit uh, to, 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 to China on first time, and they issued uh, John to communicate on the climate uh, change uh, 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 between the collaboration. And again, uh, uh, John Kerry's plan to visit China in the next several weeks. I know that uh, also, uh, John Fountain, the honorary chair of uh, Brookings, actually uh, currently is in China. And actually he met uh, uh, the Minister of uh, Environment and had a lot of uh, uh, constructive dialogues. So, so we hope you know, we can really now, facing those huge issues, facing those uh, uh, you know, the more uh, challenges that US and China can really uh, you know, work together on those uh, uh, mostly critical issues to the mankind, uh, to the whole world, uh, to the to the to the seven point five billion people because the number two number one and number two largest economy in the world have a moral responsibility to do that. So how can we really uh, improve on that? And uh, and uh, so so what do you think about uh, uh, where are the low hanging fruit? Can we start uh, uh, climate change so we can get some positive news? We can get some positive uh, uh, message across the countries. We can you know now that we have the student back and we have a U.S. student back to China. Or can we uh, have the consulate <laughs> resumed in both Houston and uh, where you, you, both of you are based in Texas and in China too? So things like that. Uh, 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 probably, uh, Neil, you, you can give some uh, uh, first. Uh, uh, you know, I'm actually, I'd like, I think I may pass the buck over to David. I'm curious about his response on the, on the student travel. You've mentioned that a couple of times. I mean, one of the, one of the, the, the great blessings of of connectivity is having so many thousands of students come to the United States every year to, to you know, it, it, we, we're a land of immigrants and I know these students aren't immigrating, but we, I, I just think it's wonderful how America, you know, has taken kind of the best of, of talent from all over the world. They come to this part of the world, they learn and go back to their countries or stay and help us build our economies. And there's so, so much value to those student um, student experiences, both the U.S. students going to China and vice versa, come to Chinese students coming here. David, what is the, what's the prospect for for that that activity cranking back up again? Yeah, well, Neil, thank you, and and a couple of points in response to to Henry's really good questions. Um, one, first of all, with respect to students, uh, it is encouraging to see us get back toward. Um, something that looks more normal in terms of the flow of students and the flow of people within the constraints of COVID-19, which are significant, but at least we're moving back in the right direction. You know, there was a, there was a 12 month uh, period where year over year, we actually saw, and I think it was from 2019 to, to mid 2020, um, we actually saw a literally 99% drop in US student visa issuance to Chinese students from, I think it was um, 80,000 to 800 approximately. That was the scale. At one point we, we, we issued 80,000 visas and then over the next 12 months we issued 800. Some of that obviously was COVID, but a lot of it was also just a very a fundamentally different view under the Trump administration about the value or what they would have regarded as the lack of value uh, in, in having students from China come to this country. What, what Neil, what you understand and what I understand, and I think what Henry understands, is that actually there's huge value in having students from all over the world come to this country and contribute to our research and development, contribute to uh, scholarship at universities, co uh, contribute to uh, the development of new ideas and innovation, new companies. And um, the notion that by turning off that spigot and shutting that down, that that's good for America is just about as dumb an idea uh, in terms of uh, the modern uh, 21st century economy as I can imagine. And so to see it move back toward uh, a more normal level, at least in terms of Chinese students coming to the United States, 
And I certainly hope we'll see an analogous uh, upward tick in US students getting back to China once the overall health situation allows for that. Uh, these exchanges are great for our countries and we need to increase them, not decrease them. Uh, I, just as a, a side note relative to um, Henry's question, in terms of what's the low hanging fruit, in addition to getting student numbers back up, I think we need to get the Fulbright pro, uh, program back up and running again. We need to get other cultural and educational exchanges back up and running. We need to get the US Peace Corps uh, uh, functioning in China again, assuming China still welcomes that. Yes, of course, Henry, you're right. We need to get the two consulates back up and running again. Uh, Neil and I both feel very strongly about that and so many other Americans. We've got to, you know, we're, we're not helping anybody by shutting down the, the Chinese Consulate General in Houston or the U.S. Consulate General in Chengdu. It, it hinders both countries' abilities to provide services for citizens, to support business and trade and so forth and so on. So there are a number of things in that area. But Henry, the final point I would make uh, that I think is um, goes to your question is uh, there are areas that the Biden administration identified very early on as uh, areas that are fruitful uh, for and that are pot potentially very beneficial to both countries in terms of uh, collaboration. One is public health. We've talked about that. Uh, and let me also note, both China and the United States made some very serious mistakes in their early handling of COVID-19. There's no question about it. That being said, the question now is how do we actually make the situation better? So we've talked about COVID-19, but also the issue of um, uh, climate, uh, climate change, just as Neil noted uh, and Henry, as you noted at the outset, the issue of arms control, the issue of nuclear non-proliferation, including on the Korean uh, peninsula, but not limited to that particular space. Now the issue of Afghanistan, the United States and China need to come together and talk about uh, this incredible uh, and tragic uh, situation that we now see in Afghanistan. And I think there's uh, much to discuss there. Uh, the question of Iran's nuclear ambitions and other issues, piracy on the high seas. There are a whole host of areas where it's in each country's interest to work together. And we just need to set emotions aside. Yes, we disagree with China. Uh, we as a nation disagree with China on any number of issues. And China disagrees with America. Yes, China does some things that are immensely problematic for America, no question. And America does some things that are very problematic for China. We have to set that aside, not in a clear-eyed way, and focus on where we can make a difference. And there are a lot of areas where we can, and that's what I hope we'll see over the coming years. Yes. Uh, yeah. Th thank you. Thank you, uh, David and Neil. I, I think absolutely. I mean, I, I agree with you. I think that. Uh, you know, uh, both U.S. and China uh, being the two largest economy has a really uh, very strong responsibility and uh, 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 to work together. I mean, you're right. I mean, the the, the, the you know the, the issues, the chaotic situation in Afghanistan. Uh, where where is next? How can we really work together on that? Uh, should we really, you know, China, U.S. Uh, and the country in the region should really work out a, a, a post a, a war plan? Uh, uh, maybe for the peace and stability there. And uh, of course, there's the issue of uh, Korea, North Korea, uh, Korea Peninsula, and there's issues of Iran, and uh, you know, China was one of the uh, talking parties there. And so there are many international issues. And, but most, most, what's more important, I, I, I think that uh, uh, this, this world economy is also need us to, uh, to really uh, work together to, to put it uh, up uh, uh, also for the developing countries, for, for Africa, for, for uh, Latin American, so many countries that we, we really need to work together. So absolutely, we need to put aside our differences and maximize our, our common common uh, positions. Uh, so David, I actually, I, I noticed that you actually, in January this year, when you uh, uh, talked at uh, the Hong Kong Forum that organized by uh, US-China Business Exchange Foundation there, that uh, you talk about the way forward. You mentioned about six uh, uh, point there, which I, I think is really interesting. Uh, you, you said, of course, uh, we should reopen uh, two consonants in Houston and Chengdu, since you and George uh, and Neil are both uh, are in Texas, where the the the, the consulate was located. I'm from Chengdu. I mean, I I really want to see uh, the consulate open there too. And also, uh, the second recommendation you said restore the Fulbright program. And third recommendation said, restore the US Peace Corps presence in China. 
and uh, and also the fossil fuel conditions, the United States uh, government should cease uh, uh, the de desist from its efforts in the shutdown Confucius Institute. And the number five is a more openness in trade and investment, uh, but also to people to pick exchanges. And, uh, and, and also six is to think about creating an international visitor leadership program, uh, China to think, uh, you know, uh, creating this program to uh, between the South and the South Americans and Chinese and in both directions. So, so you're right, because you are one of the early uh, scholars come to China, you, you can read it as firsthand. So, so for, for those things, uh, you know, plus the climate change, I mean, can we really do more? Uh, uh, and also we can elaborate on those points, that very good point you made. Well, Henry, thank you so much for noting that. And, and let me just say, um, you know, I, I think there are, there, we, we are facing a very turbulent and contentious and difficult and challenging time in the relationship right now. It is going to be very difficult to do big things uh, at this moment because of the tenor of the rhetoric and the mindset in Washington. And for that matter, you know, you sometimes hear some heated rhetoric from the Chinese side, etc. And so there's a lot of tension there. But so the question becomes, what can be done? And the things that you noted that I had talked about earlier this year, and some of which I mentioned uh, in this uh, uh, discussion, are things that are actually doable. They're, they're not things that are really that controversial. They're not things that are that difficult to do. Most of them can be done uh, with a presidential um, executive directive um, and or executive order rather. Uh, as they were, you know, in many cases, undone by Trump with an executive order, so can they be restored by the same uh, mechanism? And so you're not talking about new uh, legislation, which would be a very, you know, very difficult thing to achieve in this environment. Um, and so all of those things, I think, are just uh, I propose that we do them not because they're good for China, but because they're good for America, and yes, they're also good for the relationship, and they can serve as confidence-building measures that can get these two countries uh, back, moving back in a direction where we're actually um, speaking to each other in a business-like way and focusing on solving problems. Um, the one thing I would amplify, Henry, from the, the kind of list that you just mentioned <clears throat> of proposals I had made earlier in the year is I do think China, uh, this issue of what I referred to as the International Visitor Leadership Program or IVLP, uh, that is a program that exists in the United States, whereby many thousands of foreign citizens come to the United States at the expense of the American government, the federal uh, government and the U.S. taxpayer, and they come and spend two or three weeks, it used to be four weeks, in the United States, and they learn about this country firsthand by traveling across the country, meeting people, and learning about America, as we would say, warts and all, not just propaganda, but hey, here's the things we're doing well. Here's the things we're not doing well, and going back with a better and more textured understanding uh, to their country of the United States. I think if China were to do something like that, it would be very beneficial because not all, but many of the sharp, uh, the harshest critics of China in the United States have never been in China or never lived in China. Unlike Neil, unlike me, and unlike many others, they haven't actually interacted with Chinese people at a human level in many, many cases, and so um, they don't necessarily have the their fingers on the pulse of what's happening in that country in the same way. And so um, I, I think China would be well served to create what I've called and what the US government calls an international visitor leadership program and literally bring thousands or even tens of thousands of Americans to China uh, every year uh, in the way that the United States brings foreign citizens, including Chinese to the United States. And, and help Americans, more Americans, get a much better understanding of the real China, warts and all, the good things, the, the bad things, the things we agree with, the things we disagree with, because that foundation of understanding can lead to some really good things. And I, I think China underinvests in people-to-people um, in -people exchanges of this type, and I think China would be well served to invest more uh, and, and frankly, the United States would be well served to invest more as well. We need it more than ever uh, during this very challenging period in U.S.-China relations. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree. <laughs> I think that you, you know, we hope that we can restore the Fulbright program uh, from the U.S. But, but particularly, you, you, you make a very good recommendation that China probably should set up a, 
uh, international visitor leadership program that we can have uh, like US did in the past. And we can bring uh, hundreds and thousands of, uh, of US uh, leaders and things like that to, uh, to, to visit China and, uh, and also to understand China because Xi is believing. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, when people come and then really interact and have this human touch and human bond, uh, that will greatly change many things uh, uh, going forward. As a matter of fact, uh, CCG, we, we recently did uh, uh, launch the uh, International uh, Young Leaders Dialogue Program uh, together with a, a, a partner. And uh, actually that program, we, we are not able to attract people from outside China, but we're doing the, for, you know, uh, those international young talents already in China. That, that was really going on very well. We had a six troop, uh, organized six trips, uh, visited six provinces, uh, over hundred of them. And among 30 of them actually wrote, uh, wrote to President Xi and the President Xi replied to them. And uh, it was really encouraging this kind of a move and hope to bring more people uh, to, to come to China, to, to, to visit China and see the real China. So I think your, your, your suggestion is just uh, very timely and uh, I'm sure you know, this could be a very good uh, recommendations. Uh, so, so now Neil, I, I would like to uh, uh, ask a question for you as well. And uh, you're based in Texas. We know tax is, uh, is, uh, is uh, really abundant for the energy. Uh, uh, you know, the energy cooperation between China and the US is, uh, is one of the big, big area. I remember when, uh, when President uh, Trump came to China in 2017, he signed over $250 billion, uh, dollar, uh, you know, uh, various deals. And a big chunk of that is energy deal. And, uh, you know, uh, from uh, Texas, from Alaska, uh, so, so we, we see, uh, you know, before he started the uh, trade war, we see a lot of cooperations uh, uh, going on then. And, uh, and also, of course, I, I, I did some study there. And because if you want to uh, import the uh, energy or, or uh, whether shale gas or, or LNG from the inland of Texas to the port and then port to China, the cost from inland to the Texas port is double the tax port to China. So there's lack of infrastructure. Uh, in the, in the taxes uh, in, in really uh, you know export to China and actually China could uh, companies could help on that on those infrastructure could JV with U.S. companies to do that so that's one area the other area is also Texas is a great uh, center for for U.S. in the airspace and, uh, uh, and aviation and and you know things like that and there could be potential for for China and U.S. to collaborate on a and in our aerospace, we see now the, the famous businessman now flying uh, out of space. I mean, I remember they are saying, when they look out from uh, uh, the, the space, look at the earth, we are really one, you know, we are one, one village, one, uh, one human being raised uh, uh, in a nest. How can we really fight each other? So, so probably now from those point, of, you know, in addition to uh, consulate and other things, the area can collaborate. Uh, you know, like uh, from, from a Texas point of view and uh, or US in that matter, uh, what are those yes. areas? I mean, uh, maybe, you know, further, further to promote that. Um, first of all, I'm gonna reflect back on David's comment about comparative advantage. The trade is really about comparative advantage. Um, and one of the great advantages that Texas has uh, and that the United States up until recently has had is that we've had a surplus of, of oil production and natural gas production. And, and, and it, it, you know, I'm not, I can't speak to the infrastructure issues and the cost of transport from West Texas, from the, from the Permian Basin to the coast of Texas and then shipping it around. Um, but to the extent that there's a demand in China for the, these products and to the extent that we can provide the supply um, to meet that demand at a cost at a, on a cost reasonable basis, we should engage in that trade. Period. It's just as simple as that. And the trade trade deficit will be reduced by it, which is I really don't care about the trade deficit, but it's just a fact <laughs> that it would be reduced, yeah. and some politicians will be able to brag about how they brought the trade deficit down. Um, so yeah, there's there's clearly a, and I and I love your suggestion that. That we should be very open to having, you know, joint venture collaboration, you know, invest in uh, infra investment in infrastructure by Chinese and joint ventures with American companies to get to to you know get access to these supplies, makes total sense to me. Um, you mentioned aerospace. The 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 Bush China Foundation has been 
a co-sponsor of a of an event that's happened three years in a row called the um, the uh, International Symposium for the Peaceful Use of Space Te Technology with a focus on health. Um, and, and this um, organization has brought together uh, leading space-related agencies and organizations from around the world, from, from Europe, France, and, and um, Germany, from Japan and Russia, the United States. Um, and it's been pretty remarkable. The last couple of sessions have been in-person in China, but virtual for all those outside of China. Um, and, and it's, but the first one that was held in Hainan Island was very successful in bringing people together. And yeah, I'm not sure about the privatization of space and how th that, because there's going to be, a, there's going to be competition, you know, to get out there to try to attract customers, you know, to make the, make the economics of space travel for tourists, you know, competitive, but there's all kinds of science that can be gleaned from and, and gleaned from space related work. Um, and that's the kind of science that's going to benef benefit humankind. And, and to the extent that China brings something of value to, to that exploration and we bring something of value and the Europeans bring something, we should collaborate, no doubt about it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so, uh, so uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of interest that we, 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 U.S. and China can collaborate and there's a lot of uh, uh, things that uh, we can uh, work together. Uh, but uh, but but now and uh, as, as China now uh, you know GDP is, is is also getting larger. But also it seems that uh, maybe uh, with a number of years China may surpass US uh, uh, on the GDP uh, status. But maybe per capita still uh, far behind. But what do you think about you know this? Uh, how can we really now uh, uh, you know accept each other? Maybe co coexist with each other peacefully. We, we cannot, you know, I remember probably you said before that, you know, the U.S. as a system that fits U.S., China as a system fits China. We should not really try to change each other or something. Can we really reach that kind of a, a common understanding or maybe how we can do that? I mean, uh, I mean I'll, if, I'll give you an example. You, you, the, the topic of Afghanistan came up. My, my, my brother, President George W. Bush, and his wife, my sister-in-law, Laura, have very strong feelings about um, their concerns for the rights of women and children in, in Afghanistan with the Taliban coming back into control. There was a small uh, military force there that helped support the Afghan troop, troops of 2,500 or so. I'm not quite sure of the numbers, but very small compared to what's on the Korean Peninsula today. And, and it seems to me that for civilized nations around the world that are concerned for the rights of these women and these children that, that may be you know, thrown back into the dark ages or the stone ages through this change of leadership, that civilized nations would be motivated to work together, to keep a presence there, to maintain the stability. The American people are kind of tired of, of being the, the sole, what's perceived to be the sole protector. There were allies there, but not in great forces. But the American people elected Biden with his promise to withdraw. President Trump made the, the commitment to withdraw. A better strategy would have been to say, let's get countries from all over the world, people that have a, a notion of what, what it is to be civilized and find our common humanity and work together you know, to secure the rights of the people of Afghanistan, not to nation build, but to be protectors of those basic human rights. Um, so that's, that may be idealistic and naive, but I do believe we're going to get there. The world is becoming so connected, so close. So, you know, there's everything is, is, is far more transparent than it has been in the past. And, um, and so where there's a wrong that needs to be righted, we need to work together to, to right that wrong. And, and of course, I'm, I'm on the edge of very controversial issues here, specifically related to the treatment of minorities in Xinjiang, for example, I, I just hope the Chinese are very, very transparent about what's going on there and that the, that the truth be known so that the world can settle down. And, um, you know, and, and in the meantime, I'm all in favor of America expressing our values that where there are human rights challenges, let's bring people from all over the world to put pressure on it to, to address those human rights related issues. And that relates to Afghanistan and other places in the world today. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, yeah, yeah. I think that uh, that's exactly. I think the more communication and, uh, and and as I said, you know, the visit of each other is is so crucial. As a matter of fact, I mean, Xinjiang now is really welcoming uh, foreigners to visit. I mean, so because of the COVID, we really hope that more people come to Xinjiang and visit that, and that probably will clear, clear things up, uh, uh, as as you said. Um, I've been to Xinjiang so, twice, by the way, not recently, but I've been there twice and okay, we'll really enjoy it. Come, 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 come back again. <laughs> we love to okay. show you around <laughs> okay. again. Yeah, yeah, please. Yes. So, so David, uh, what's your uh, uh, take on, on the question uh, about how we can really, you know, uh, can we really coexist peacefully together and, uh, and maybe gradually uh, Uh, accept each other differences because, for example, this COVID nineteen, China has been managing now with uh, with China basically putting a lot of community interests uh, on individual interests, whereas U.S. is really emphasize human rights and they cannot violate, and 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 that the whole society actually has less freedom, whereas China probably individually you suffer a bit, but the whole society gained a lot of uh, freedom and right on that. So, so what's your uh, ideas on that? Well, Henry, thanks. That's a great question. And, and let me just say, um, first of all, back on the topic of energy, I want to make a quick point, and then I'll come to the, the, the broader and very important topic that you've raised in terms of how we can, uh, you know, go forward together. Um, on energy, uh, just to amplify some of the really good points that Neil made, um, you know, we at the Bush China Foundation care a lot about the issue of energy. We've been advocates for um, an idea that we created, we coined, called the U.S.-China Energy Free Trade and Investment Agreement, or U.S.-E.F.T.I.A., or F.T.A., as we call it. And the U.S.-China Energy Free Trade and Investment Agreement is an idea that we are advocating, uh, that we're building out, and that we hope we can um, advocate for the implementation of. And it's a very simple concept at, its, at the conceptual level, and it's exactly what Neil said. Um, in terms of energy, uh, the United States has it, China needs it, so let's do it. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty simple. We can, we can genu genuinely create a win-win in the energy area, and our idea is take energy out of the trade war, fast-track it for, uh, uh, for a, a more robust trade and, and exchange, and create the legislative and policy context and um, regulatory uh, predictability so that the infrastructure inv investments, Henry, that you mentioned can be made and so that we can export, for example, liquefied natural gas, <clears throat> which Texas has in huge abundance to China, which has said that it wants to double its liquefied natural, natural gas consumption over the next uh, 10 years or so. Uh, and move from 7% of the energy mix to 15%. It's a perfect scenario where uh, we can sell something that we have, China can buy something that it needs. We can put a Texas sized dent in the US deficit for those who care about that, just as Neil said exactly correctly. And everybody walks away a winner and, 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 above, and America walks away a winner, but the state of Texas really walks away a winner and others that produce liquefied natural gas. It's an obvious idea. The reason that we don't see the kind of trade in that area is because of the, poli the, the legislative policy and regulatory uh, unpredictability that we have seen surge in the last several years. Nobody wants to make the investment of billions or tens of billions of dollars that would allow this trade to occur in terms of terminals uh, that can deal with liquefied natural gas and so on. And the bottom line is this is an easy one and we ought to do it. So we've been advocating that. And just very briefly, we've also advocated for the idea of the United States and China actually working together, uh, governments, former government officials, business leaders, uh, nonprofits, and others, to come together to mitigate the impact of energy poverty in the developing world, and specifically in what we might term the bottom billion, to use the term that was coined by others, by another author, uh, and to, to, you know, one of the big problems among the one seventh of the population that is least fortunate uh, or poorest is energy poverty. And so what can the United States and China do together to alleviate and mitigate the impacts of energy poverty on that segment of the global population? We're working with the Rockefeller Foundation on a, a really interesting project in that area. 
But Henry, to your broader point, um, the, I think the one thing I just want to say is that um, those of us, I think, who understand uh, China well and who've lived there, been there many times, et cetera, um, understand something that we don't often say, but that I think is true. And that is a number of the differences between the United States and China are simply irreconcilable, period. We are never going to see eye to eye on those issues. We're never probably going to see eye to eye on, uh, on the issue of Taiwan, for example. China has its view, the United States has its view. The views are essentially irreconcilable. Uh, we're not going to see the issue of the South China Sea the same way. China has its long held view. The United States and many other countries have a very different view. We're not going to get to a point where we have a meeting, come away from it and say, hey, now we agree on it. So there are some irreconcilable, and by the way, same for Hong Kong, same for the issue of human rights and a number of other issues. So the point is, um, given that there are differences that will always be part of the fabric of the relationship between our two countries, how do we manage the relationship in light of that? And I think the view that Neil and that I and that the Bush China Foundation and other moderates in the United States, the few of them that, that seem, to, seem to be out there at this time, is it can be done. We can have a business-like and a, and a, a functional, constructive, results-oriented, um, mutually beneficial, and politically sustainable relationship, even with those differences being unreconciled. And we ought to aspire to do that. And rather than say, look, because we disagree on all these different profound issues, let's take our ball and go home. We advocate the opposite. We advocate, uh, Neil advocates, I advocate the Bush China Foundation for the idea that this is all the more reason that we need to come together uh, with a problem solving mindset. So that's what I would say. I think it can be done. It just requires the vision, the vision that George H.W. Bush had, the vision that Neil has as our founder and chairman. Um, and the vision that we seek to uh, give expression to at this foundation, um, it's possible to do. We're going to keep doing everything we can to move in that direction. And I know that there are many in China that feel the same way and many in America as well. And we're going to continue to stand strong for that sensible, common sense, moderate perspective on how to move this relationship forward. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Neil and, 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 and David. Actually, you, you made a lot of... Uh... Uh, you know, was why I know this point. I, I, I think that uh, you, you are right. You know, we, we, we should probably really maximize the, uh, the, the commonalities, the, the common ground and minimize the differences. Of course, as you said, because of the culture, uh, historical and, and geographically, uh, all those big differences. Uh, you know, there, there are some differences probably will remain uh, for a long time to come, uh, but, but definitely we have such a huge uh, uh, interest, uh, a common interest uh, not only for the both countries, but for the world, that we should really work together so that uh, we can really avoid the uh, uh, catastrophe or maybe a hot war. I mean, uh, you know, these days uh, uh, we, we had a lot of uh, uh, populism and nationalism on, on the rising on both sides, and that is really dangerous. I think we, as you said, moderate, but maybe cool heads and realistic. I think we need more people like that in both, 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 both places. So absolutely important. Uh, now we, my staff was telling me we had, uh, you know, uh, 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 had, had, you know, live from several portals. We have almost, we have over two hundred thousand uh, viewers uh, watching us uh, and listen to us. And uh, 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 but but we had also collected some questions from online uh, viewers as well, uh, uh, media as well. We have a uh, 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 a few questions, but so I just uh, uh, read them out. And we have one question from CGTN. Uh, basically, was saying. Uh, uh, in, in which area that can China and U.S. Co cooperate among the pandemic uh, uh, area? I think we already probably covered some of that. Uh, but what do you think of Biden's Afghanistan uh, policy? And uh, uh, can China and the U.S. work together uh, in Afghanistan and, and how? Uh, those, those are from CGT. And then we have another two from uh, China News Agency. Uh, regarding the investigation of origin of virus, uh, some argue that uh, uh, there's more politics into that rather than the scientists into that. And uh, so what do you thought on that, how we can get out of that? And how should China and U.S. cooperate uh, on fighting against a, a pandemic? So basically, they've been 
maybe uh, you know linger on those uh, questions that we, we we touched upon briefly. Uh, perhaps you could give a, a, a your uh, you know uh, answer to that uh, as you see your feet, and maybe uh, maybe Neil, uh, and then we'll have uh, David. But, but of course, with the kind of question okay. we just covered before. I'll 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 start on the uh, the last question you raised about the origins of the virus. You know, I'm I, I'm not as concerned, for example, about the origin of climate change, whether humans cause climate change or whether it's a natural occurrence or whether it's some combination. The fact is there's climate change and we need to address it. And there's clearly a role for the US and China and all the nations of the world to lock arms in addressing it. China's got its 2060 you know, carbon neutrality pledge, the government, Governments at all levels, the private sector will be unified in their effort to do that. And I have no doubt that China will be major players in, in the collaboration to try to address climate change. I mean, the same thing kind of rings true to me with the virus. Who cares where it or originated? Whether it originated you know, in a lab or from a bat or from the United States or from others, wherever it originated, who cares? The fact is we have a pandemic that continues to affect the lives of hundreds of thousands of people all across the globe. And there's, there's a pressing need for mature civilized nations in the world to work together. And so, so I, David will, may have more specific ideas on how we can work together, um, but it seems like collaboration is very natural when it comes to something as big as this and the origins of it. And I, and I, will, I will put a little, you know, caveat that, you know, I reject the idea that there was some malicious effort to release a virus, a, a, pan, a virus that causes a pandemic. I think that's a crazy notion. That there was some intent from one side or the other, you know, to do this, do this on purpose. So you throw away the crazy conspiracy theories um, and just assume that there was, there was, there was, you know, an origin of some kind doesn't matter where it originated. Let's deal with it together. Yeah, right. I, absolutely. I mean, we, we, we can't find where the AIDS originated. There was some say in Africa, some say in America. You know, who cares? Yeah. I mean, that's that's <laughs> cured. Let's find a cure for that. And and exactly. also, uh, you know, I mean, how how would it be so silly for Chinese to to invent the virus and the cure itself is started in China? You know, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. So it's a it huge no cost. Sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so David, so David what, what's your uh, you know answers to those questions? Yeah, well, thanks, Henry. And uh, l let me just start by saying I completely agree with what Neil just said, that the, the idea that this was something that was unleashed upon the world with intentionality is ludicrous and, and, and just not a serious idea. Um, why would it, a country unleash something on itself and everyone else that it trades with and so forth? It just doesn't make any sense. Um, so yeah, again, there, there are areas, I think, within the context of uh, COVID-19 and pandemics more generally that we ought to work on together. Let me make one point at the outset, which is COVID-19 is not going to be the last pandemic that we as a world ever face. I mean, we know that. There will periodically be pandemics. They'll originate here, they'll originate there, uh, meaning very, you know, this country, country A, country B. Um, and we will have to cope as a global community with pandemics forever, uh, periodically. And so learning how to work together and to actually solve uh, medical and public health and, and uh, epidemi epidemiological problems is a good thing for our countries to be able to do. I think we were able to do that to a greater degree when the, when the relationship was less politically charged than it is at present. And we've gotten away from it, but it's too, it's, uh, it's unfortunate for all of us that that is so. And rather than focusing on the blame game and demonizing and so forth in any direction, uh, just as Neil said, and as I said earlier, we should have been focused on solving the problem right at the outset. I'll be honest, as I've said, and I said in the Global Times, one of China's uh, prominent newspapers uh, back in May of last year, that I think both the United States and China uh, China first chronologically and the United States second chronologically because of the way that the, the, uh, the, the pandemic uh, developed, uh, didn't respond in the earliest stages of COVID-19 to the pandemic with the openness, the transparency, or the sense of urgency that we should have. 
And I think China made significant mistakes in its early handling. And I think the United States also made significant mistakes in its early handling. Given that, the question now, just as Neil said, is how do we actually uh, work together to solve, uh, to, to solve problems for real people? And I think we can do that in the areas of uh, research and development, vac uh, vaccine, um, you know, comparing notes on what's working, what's not working, bringing uh, medical practitioners and public uh, policy experts together uh, around the issue of the Delta variant, specifically helping each other uh, as we did in the early stages in both directions. Uh, with uh, providing uh, materiel, um, personal protective equipment. Uh, that was a good thing to do. I'm glad that we as a foundation were a part of that along with many others in both directions. Um, so there are a lot of things that I think we can do, but fundamentally uh, focusing on solving a public health challenge rather than politicizing a medical issue and a public health issue is, is what we need to be focused on. On the issue of... Um, you know, Afghanistan, I think there is a clearly an opportunity now um, because of, unfortunately, the, the, the tragic circumstances in the country with the Taliban retaking Afghanistan. Uh, there is an opportunity and I think a need for the United States and China as players that have significant interests in Afghanistan coming together and, and really talking to each other honestly about um, you know, what, what we're thinking about the situation, what our assessments of the situation are, what our, uh, you know, uh, plans are as individual countries relative to how each country intends to engage Afghanistan going forward. Um, and I think there's a lot that could be done to exchange views. And in fact, the Bush China Foundation uh, this October, uh, in, in less than two months, uh, will be bringing uh, people together on this topic um, to kind of get a conversation started, and I'm sure others will be doing that as well. But I think anytime there's a global uh, crisis or a global challenge, uh, the two countries, among others, that have to be at the table are the United States and China as the two largest economies, two members of the P5, permanent members of the Security Council of the United Nations, major global players with pres presences across uh, economically and in terms of development politically across the globe. And Afghanistan is a clear case where I think there's benefit to sitting down and saying, what do you think about what's happening there? And here's what we think about what's happening there. Just at that level alone, there's utility. So, you know, all of these are areas where I think um, there is room for improvement. Um, and uh, I hope that we'll see that improvement because, uh, as I've often said, uh, the United States cannot be all that it was meant to become without China. And China cannot be all that it was meant to become without America. We need each other. Whether we like it or not, we do. And we've got to get this relationship right because the consequences of getting it wrong are far reaching and very unpleasant. Great. Uh, th thank you, uh, Neil and David, both for, for, for voicing such a very clear message. I think that is really uh, very uh, stimulating uh, for people in both countries and probably to the world as well. I, I think you're absolutely right. We really need to uh, concentrate on working together in solving the pandemic uh, uh, problem and the challenges and preventing the future pandemics. As, as you said, we may not be just this time. We could come again and we really have to work together as a human race rather than as a country. So, so probably we should have a summit of some kind or maybe WHO should convene a big uh, countries together to really work out some uh, recommendations uh, for how to work together. Uh, very importantly, uh, I, I think that is really facing the whole countries in the world. And of course, uh, Afghanistan, I, I agree with Neil that uh, probably even before the, the last evacuation, we, you know, the U.S. should get every country to work together. Uh, you know, we could talk, have a have country in the region and have a discussion. Maybe we could have the U.N. to have play more active role. Or, or even have a UN peacekeeping force to, to safeguard the evacuation uh, uh, to prevent future disasters. So, so there's many things we could talk. Absolutely, we, we need to bring uh, all parties together. So now given the time, we probably come to the conclusion of our, <laughs> our dialogue. Uh, I, I think we started with this dialogue with the uh, 50 years of uh, US-China exchanges. Uh, started with, uh, of course, with the Nixon visit 50 years ago, started with uh, uh, China joined the UN when, when George H.W. Bush as a, a U.S. UN ambassador then and uh, had the, you know, uh, Neil was mentioned that they had a really great <laughs> encounter then with the Chinese delegation. 
but also with the legacy of both both presidents, I mean, President George H. W. Bush, but also H. George W. Bush as well. I mean, uh, 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 George Jr. Uh, president as well. I, I think that uh, the legacy is uh, is uh, have more exchanges, more dialogues, uh, more you know, uh, 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 you know, understanding of each other, and then also maybe uh, we should uh, uh, try to avoid. Uh, uh, you know, major uh, 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 disasters and deterioration, and we should really seek the common grounds and minimize the difference. So maybe just in concluding words uh, uh, from both of you, uh, you know, what's your final message to, to, to our audience here in China, maybe also around the world, uh, that uh, given the 50 years of uh, uh, anniversary of exchanges of, uh, between China and US, uh, 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 with China joining the UN for 50 years with China, uh, you know, first uh, secret visit by uh, Dr. Kissinger to China 50 years ago. And also with the two presidents of Bush, <laughs> maintaining, promoting, and uh, uh, strengthening the ties uh, during those uh, past years. How can we look forward? And how can we really uh, going forward, uh, given this, uh, you know, Bush, uh, both President Bush, you know, that's really proud of, I'm very honored to have a, a new Bush uh, uh, the dialogue with us. You, your family is really, probably, uh, you know, one of the greatest in the history that produced the two presidents of the United States, uh, that, uh, that now you have a Bush uh, Foundation <laughs> to, to still working on Bush China Foundation that, uh, that shows that uh, the, the, the family is really care about this relationship. So we want to hear the last word uh, from you and also from the president of uh, uh, CEO of uh, Bush China Foundation, David uh, Firestan. So Neil, why don't you go first? Well, thank you, Henry. Um, I think I'll, I'll start by reiterating that my father often said, publicly, openly said that the, the bilateral relationship between the United States and China was the most important bilateral relationship in the world. Um, and, and it was prescient of him to say that many years ago because it's becoming more true now than ever, given the, the gravity of the, the issues that we face you know, as humans on Earth. Um, I, I would further say that globalization has been a given the, the United States economy, our GDP and our individual wealth, a huge shot in the arm. Our biggest partner in the world of globalization has been China. Uh, so the United States has been a beneficiary of trade as imperfect as it is, as David pointed out, with all of its warts. This trade relationship has benefited our country tremendously, and there's no doubt that China has been an, an enormous beneficiary of, of our trade relationship as well. Um, and as we've had more and more cultural exchanges and student exchanges, you know, there have been millions of Chinese visitors to the United States. They all go happily go home to China. There's, you know, it's not like there's something res restraining them from getting back into their home or their desire to go home. But the reality is that we've benefited tremendously from this bilateral relationship. And so the past to me is, is what we should look for, you know, look to, to, the, to kind of predicting the future. The future is going to be even better. And we've come into this kind of crazy time where China's rise is all of a sudden being recognized by politicians as a threat to the United States. And, and once we can get over the hurdle that China doesn't represent an, 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 a threat of, of, you know, to our national security or to our economy or to our freedoms or to our basic way of life, then and, and through dialogue, we'll establish, you know, better understanding and more cooperation. So I, I pledge to continue to work with David and our team at the Bush China Foundation to do whatever I can to, to you know, help speak truth and and shed light on on this very very important relationship in a way that hopefully will allow for greater collaborations across the board not only on basic on all these major issues but on on basic things that are taking place day to day our gov governments at all different levels should be having meetings to 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 you know to share and to better understand to put ourselves in the other guy's shoes and to, to um, you know, create a better, more peaceful and harmonious world as a result. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Neil. Yeah, David, please, your last word. 
Well, Henry, thank you so much. And, and uh, let, let me just um, conclude by saying, again, it's been an honor to be with you. And this is such a wonderful platform. And, and we're just grateful for the opportunity for, to have this conversation. Um, you know, President George H.W. Bush brought incredible vision to the U.S.-China relationship. And fundamentally, he asked himself a question about the relationship that was different than the kind of thing that we're seeing today. Today, political figures are sort of saying, where is the relationship going to be 15 minutes from now when I do my next tweet? And what President George H.W. Bush asked was, where do I want this relationship to be in the service of the interests of our nation 50 years from now and 100 years from now? And that far-sightedness, that, that ability to kind of uh, pay less attention to the headline of the moment and more attention to where this relationship could go over the long haul. That was a hallmark of President George H.W. Bush. And that's what we uh, carry forward at the Bush China Foundation. The notion that what's happening today is less important than where this relationship is ultimately going to be. And we fundamentally believe, as, as Neil has noted, and as we've said in this conversation, that the U.S.-China relationship is the most con single most consequential bilateral relationship in the world. It matters to America. And of course, it matters to China as well. And we've got to get it right. Uh, and we have to think in terms of the long term, because the turbulence that we're seeing today will not always be with us. Yes, there will always be disagreements and differences in perspective on some pretty important issues. But the tonality shifts from time to time. Uh, the way that we think of different countries can shift based on what's happening in the world. And we're looking at the long-term interests of the United States. That's the angle uh, that we're coming at this relationship from. Um, the final thing I want to say, Henry, is I think, I think we as Americans need to do a better job as a whole, as a whole people and as a nation, in recognizing the validity and the, tr and the truth of two statements at the same time. Number one, China is the most formidable competitor that the United States will ever have in the lifetimes of every American alive today. And, and the reverse of that is true as well. But it is also true that China is an indispensable partner to the United States, whether we like it or not. And America is an indispensable partner to China. We have a stake in each other's future, and we need to be able to work together with that in mind and I think if we can recognize that there is truth to both of those ideas, and by the way, competition is not a bad thing. Competition is what has made the world what it is today. It's generated progress. It's generated the better mousetrap. It's generated technological innovation. So yes, we compete, but yes, we must also cooperate. We understand that at the Bush China Foundation, and I, I couldn't be more privileged and honored than to have the opportunity to be Neil's partner uh, in carrying forward the legacy of someone for whom I have extraordinary reverence and respect, President George H.W. Bush. Thank you. Thank you, uh, David, for your really uh, impressive remarks uh, uh, in the last uh, conclusion. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, half century is really, uh, it's long, but also it's short. But uh, like uh, I, I remember when I saw the photos when, when, uh, when uh, George H.W. Bush uh, president was Riding bicycle in Beijing, he was uh, he was uh, and and Neil was such a young age. I I'm a teenager then. Now we are all getting getting senior, getting old now. So so what has happened in the last half a century has really uh, remarkable. You know, China become, you know, from uh, from the one of the poorest uh, country now become one of the second largest economy. That that's incredible. I think I, I agree with you. You know, China U.S. is in this in this sense indispensable for from each other and really need each other. Uh, so how can we con 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 come, you know, together and continue our efforts to maintain such a relation? I think the Bush Foundation, Bush China Foundation has done a remarkable job and also CCG is also, we're trying to become a bridge between, uh, uh, you know, China and outside world. So, so we hope that we'll, we'll continue our dialogue, we'll continue our discussion, but also we'll, we'll you know, uh, have those rational, have those, uh, uh, you know, reasonable and also uh, a more human <laughs> a touch uh, between our, our two countries. So, so Neil, that uh, your 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 father and your brother came to the Beijing 
uh, Summer Olympics and the hope that the Winter Olympics uh, in the uh, next February we we'll have you come again <laughs> for the for the Winter Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> we hope that uh, you know we 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 have those sports, people to people exchange, student exchange, tourism, you know, and uh, and uh, all the other uh, uh, program that can revive. We really, uh, as you uh, as David said, we cannot separate from each other. We have a huge bond, and let's continue the legacy of the of the both Bush president. So thank you so much, and thank you for our viewers, uh, uh, so many of them tonight, and also around the world. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Thank you, Henry. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.